Hi everyone, welcome to our discussion on lesson 3. Lesson 3 is on bio-risk levels or the bio-safety levels and the different biological safety cabinets. So in this discussion, we will be able to learn about the different biosafety levels, what are the agents that are classified in each bio-risk levels, and what kind of biological safety cabinets are appropriate to use for each of the biosafety levels. According to the Canadian standard, biological agents are classified into four risk groups. Um, agent risk group 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, I think this was mentioned in the previous lesson on bio-risk management system. But today, we are actually following the World Health Organization standard wherein they classified biological agents into four biosafety levels, that is BSL 1, 2, 3, and 4, wherein the higher the level means the policies are more strict and biological containment are always required. One of the mitigation measures is the use of your biological safety cabinet. This is classified under the engineering controls as seen in the hierarchy of your mitigation control measures and um, it is understandable that as the biosafety level becomes higher the biological safety cabinet required is also more sophisticated and it must be equipped with advanced safety measures and of course um, it is more expensive Biosafety levels are a set of biocontainment precautions that are designed to protect not only the laboratory personnel but also the surrounding environment and the community. The biosafety levels are ranked based on the organisms that are being researched in the laboratory or the type of organisms that are being handled inside the research facility. The reason biosafety levels are so important is because they dictate the type of work practices that are allowed to take place in a laboratory setting. They also heavily influence the overall design of the facility in question as well as the type of specialized safety equipment used within it. We start first with BSL-1. BSL-1 is the lowest biosafety level and is applied to the agents which pose the least threat to the lab worker and the environment. Examples of agents or microorganisms under biosafety level 1 are the non-pathogenic strain of E. coli, the K12 strain, and Bacillus subtilis. Meaning to say that if a particular person or the community are exposed to these microorganisms, um, they do not pose severe or fatal disease to the concerned individuals. That's why the individual risk and the community risk are low for microorganisms under BSL-1. Then we go to BSL-2. BSL-2 or Biosafety Level 2, this includes agents that cause human diseases. For example, we have Salmonella typhi, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, Hepatitis B and C viruses, as well as your adenoviruses. Personal working in these laboratories require greater attention to prevent any injuries such as cuts, ingestions, etc. So for the risk groups, for the individual risk, uh, there is a moderate um, exposure to the microorganisms and for the community risk, it's very low. Then we have BSL-3. For BSL-3, this includes working on pathogenic microbes that can cause serious disease through inhalation. For example, we have Mycobacterium tuberculosis or the causative agent of TB. We also have yellow fever virus, um, HIV, and West Nile virus. So there is a high risk for an individual to acquire or contract the diseases caused by the microorganisms classified under BSL-3 and for the community risk, there is a moderate um, possibility for them to acquire the viruses or the causative agents. 
For the BSL-4, this includes work with highly dangerous and exotic microbes and infections through these microbes cannot be treated or immunized and are usually fatal. For example, we have the Ebola virus, SARS, and the um, fungi, the coccidiodes EBTs. So, individuals and communities exposed to these types of or microorganisms classified under BSL-4, they have a high possibility of contracting or acquiring the disease. On safety practices and containment barriers, for BSL-1, uh, we, we have already known the agents that are classified under BSL-1. So in the previous slide, it was stated that you have your non-pathogenic E. coli strain and also your Bacillus subtilis. So for BSL-1, the agents classified here are not known to consistently cause diseases in healthy adults. Maybe they can cause disease, but usually for immunocompromised individuals. Because usually for immunocompromised individuals, those agents we mentioned earlier are already classified as opportunistic pathogens. Okay, so for the practices under BSL-1, we have standard microbiological practices. So any laboratory personnel exposed or handling agents in the BSL-1, they should practice uh, standard microbiological procedures. So we have um, mechanical pipetting, we also have safe handling of sharps, uh, avoiding splashes or aerosols, uh, also washing hands, prohibition on drinking, smoking, and food in the laboratories, and signage of biohazards. We also have the proper wearing of personal protective equipment. So the research is carried out on the benches without any special contaminant equipment. So you can actually process the samples in an open working area, even not within the biosafety cabinet. Okay, and all the infectious materials should be decontaminated before being disposed of. So what are the safety equipment or primary barriers that are utilized for BSL-1? Actually, there are no primary barriers required. The personnel will only have to wear complete PPE, laboratory coats, gloves, eyes, and face protection um, when they process the specimen containing the positive agent. For the secondary barriers, laboratory bench and sink required. So I think I've mentioned this um, a while ago that you can just perform the research on the benches without any special contaminant equipment. So that is for your BSL-1. For BSL-2, the agents associated here are those agents that can cause human diseases and the portals of entry or the routes of transmission include percutaneous injury, ingestion, and also mucous membrane exposure. The following practices should be carried out in a biosafety level 2 laboratory. So we have here all the practices mentioned under BSL-1 plus limited access, need to say that only delegated individuals who are assigned to enter a BSL-2 facility are allowed and then biohazard warning signs. We also have proper handling of your sharps or sharps precautions and then biosafety manual defining policies on any needed waste decontamination or medical surveillance policy. So basically the practices under BSL-2 are all the practices you can find in BSL-1 and then you also have procedures that can cause infections are carried out in a biological safety cabinet. So for BSL-2, that is the defining procedure between BSL-1 and 2 because for BSL-2, you can already make use of your biosafety cabinet and the waste materials should be decontaminated before disposal. There should be an eye wash and a sink readily available for utilization by the laboratory personnel and of course biohazard signs should be provided 
in the BSL-2 facility. For the safety equipment or primary barriers for BSL-2, we have the Class 1 or the Class 2 biosafety cabinets or other physical containment devices used for all manipulations of agents that causes splashes or aerosols of infectious material. So basically all of the research procedures are to be done inside the biosafety cabinet and the laboratory personal concern should be wearing personal protective equipment. For the facilities or the secondary barriers in the facilities, we have apart from the sink and the working area, there should be an autoclave available for utilization. So our autoclave, this is a very important laboratory equipment because it is used to sterilize our apparatus, our glasswares, and also it can be used to um, kill the microorganisms that we handled or processed inside the laboratory before they are properly disposed of. For BSL-3, again, the agents belonging or classified under BSL-3 are those microorganisms that are indigenous or exotic with the potential for aerosol transmission or the possibility of acquiring the disease caused by the microorganisms can be through inhalation. The disease may have serious or lethal consequences. For the practices that must be observed when working in a BSL-3 facility, we have the BSL-2 practices we mentioned in the previous slide, plus controlled access, we also have decontamination of all waste, decontamination of laboratory clothing before laundry, and the baseline serum. So the baseline serum, this one, um, or the principle behind the baseline serum is this. Many infections do not result in an overt disease condition. So sometimes infections are detected by the development of antibodies to the agent in question. Therefore, a program has been established for people engaged in certain types of biological research. This includes collection of pre-assignment serum as well as routine periodic specimens. So if an illness occurs which may be related to the agent the person is working with, additional serum samples will be collected. Before a person can initiate a BSL-3 research, he or she must provide a baseline serum sample which will either be banked by employee health or tested for antibodies to the research pathogen with your consent. So the bank sample is a private confidential specimen that cannot be tested without your consent. It provides a baseline sample that can be evaluated in the event of an exposure incident with risk group agents. Specifically, agents that require BSL-3 work practices or containment. So that is the purpose of your baseline serum. So um, apart from what I have mentioned, under BSL-3 practices, the researchers are also under medical surveillance and are immunized against certain microbes. For the safety equipment or the primary barriers used for BSL-3, we have class 1 or class 2 biosafety cabinets or other physical containment devices used for all open manipulation of agents. And then we also have the proper wearing of our personal protective equipment. For the secondary barriers, we have physical separation from access corridors. We have self-closing, double door access, exhausted air not recirculated, meaning to say that the purpose of our biosafety cabinet is to actually um, clean the room air, but some of our biosafety cabinets are designed in such a way that when the air is exhausted, um, it should not be recirculated back into the room. It must be exhausted into the environment. Negative airflow into the laboratory, the entry through airlock or anteroom, and there should be a hand wash station for hand hygiene near the laboratory exit.
Finally, we have BSL-4. So, the agents that are categorized under BSL-4 are those agents that are highly dangerous or exotic which pose high risk of aerosol transmitted laboratory infections that are usually severe or fatal and there are no available vaccine or treatment for the infection they can cause. Usually the agents for BSL-4, there are no available data yet about them. So most of the research personnel or laboratory personnel who are working in a BSL-4 nearly have to practice extensive precautionary measure because even the mode of transmission is not yet known for microorganisms classified under BSL-4. For the practices, we have the BSL-3 practices plus there must be changing of clothing before entering a BSL-4 facility. So your attire when you go to the facility is different from what you're going to wear when you're already inside the facility. There should be shower on exit and all the materials must be decontaminated upon exit from the facility because all the materials that are present inside a BSL-4 facility are considered highly infectious. What are the primary barriers or safety equipment we can see inside a BSL-4 facility, we have all procedures are conducted in class 3, 2, or 1 biosafety cabinets in combination with full body, air supplied positive pressure personal suit. So the PPE that the laboratory personnel is wearing inside a BSL-4 facility is very different from the PPE in your BSL-1, 2, and 3. Okay, and then the secondary barriers in the facility of with BSL-4 containment, there should be a separate building or isolated zone. There must be a dedicated supply and exhaust, vacuum and decontamination systems, and other requirements outlined in BMBL or the Biosafety in Microbiological and Biomedical Laboratories. Next, we go to the different types of cabinets. What are the basic principles behind each biosafety cabinet, selection and installation of your biosafety cabinet, and how do we use or manipulate our biosafety cabinet? So we have three types of cabinets. We have our chemical fume hood. We also have the laminar flow cabinet. And lastly, our biohazard safety cabinet or the biological safety cabinet. So these three types of cabinets are significant in processing or dealing with reagents and even biological hazards inside the laboratory. Okay, so they add or serve as an added protection for the laboratory personnel aside from wearing personal protective equipment. Um, these cabinets also help laboratory personnel be protected from the sample they are processing. Our first type of cabinet is the fume hood. It's also known as your fume cupboard or fume closet. This is a type of local ventilation device designed to limit exposure to hazardous or toxic fumes produced by the chemicals we handle inside the laboratory, vapors or dust. This cabinet, it does not contain any HEPA filter. That's why there is no protection for biohazard agent. And the only function of this cabinet is to remove toxic chemicals. So these are our fume holes. This one. The next type of cabinet is the laminar flow cabinet. So this one protects only the product or the test process, but it does not protect the personal or the environment. So this type of cabinet, it should not be used when processing or dealing with chemical fumes or biohazardous agents because it has an open face, meaning to say it does not contain any sash as compared to your chemical fume hood and your biosafety cabinet, which gives the personal working with the chemical directly exposed to the air being blown via the grill work. And it should only be used when dealing with non-infectious materials. 
Our last type of cabinet is the biosafety cabinet. So our biosafety cabinets provide effective primary containment for work with infectious material or toxins when they are properly maintained and used in conjunction with good laboratory techniques. So basically, the personnel can acquire full protection from the biohazardous specimens being processed inside the laboratory with the use of the biosafety cabinet if he or she also manages to follow precautionary measures and good laboratory practices. Our biosafety cabinets are classified into three. We have the class one biosafety cabinet. Um, it offers personal and environment protection but not product or specimen protection. And then we have our class 2 and 3 biosafety cabinets which offer personal, product, and environment protection. All of our biosafety cabinets contain HEPA filters or the high efficiency particulate air filters which is designed to remove particulates, specifically our aerosols with microorganisms from the air. But our HEPA filters are not for chemical vapors or gases. The basic principle of our biosafety cabinets uh, lie in the personal protection and the kind of air being released into the environment. So for personal protection, this is provided through the presence of a continuous stream of inward air, which is known as air inflow. The air inflow is an important aspect of our biosafety cabinets because it helps protect or prevent aerosols from escaping into the room through the sash or the front opening of our biosafety cabinet, especially if we are dealing with biohazardous samples, there should be there should always be the presence of an inward air to block aerosols from going into the room and then we have the exhaust air or the air exhausted into the surrounding environment or outside the building the exhaust air must always be HEPA filtered to remove the microorganisms present in the air before it's being released to the environment so we're also trying to protect the environment through the presence of our HEPA filters. Aside from the HEPA filter, we also have another type or kind of filter that can be used inside a biosafety cabinet. We have the UPA filter. Our UPA filter, it means ultra low penetration air. And in terms of the ability or capacity of the filter to remove microorganisms, we have our HEPA filter is only capable of removing 99.99% of most microorganisms up to the 0.3 micrometers in diameter. Um, this is referring to the size of the particle that can be removed by the filter. And then our UPA filter is effective in removing 99.9995% of microorganisms up to the 0.12 micrometers in diameter. The classical definition of our HEPA filter is that it can remove 99.97% of microorganisms up to the 0.3 micrometers, but most of the biosafety cabinets and laminar flow cabinets used in the United States make use of the 99.99% um, removal of microorganisms up to the 0.3 micrometers in diameter. If we try to compare the effectivity of these two filters in removing microorganisms, it can be implied that your UPA filter is more effective because it can filter uh, the size of a virus that is 0.12 micrometers in diameter compared to have a filter which can remove 0.3 micrometers in diameter, which is actually bigger as compared to the UPA filter. But if UPA is better than HEPA at capturing more and smaller particles such as tiny viruses, why are we still using HEPA today? Or why is it that your HEPA filter is more commonly used? Well, UPA filter collects more particles in that hard-to-trap 
0.12 to 0.4 range, they are only necessary for specialized applications, including microelectronic manufacturing or medical laboratories, removing particulates from clean rooms, or filtering toxic surgical plumes emitted during electrosurgical operations. HEPA filters, by contrast, are much more broadly used because they are considered optimal for most biological applications, including in the healthcare. As an example of why HEPA filters work so well in hospitals, consider that viruses, which are smaller than 0.3 micrometers, and theoretically could pass through a HEPA filter, most often travel on a large particles such as your saliva or sweat, thereby being trapped in the filter. So even if your virus um, is less than 0.3 micrometers, which in this sense or in this slide can be filtered using the UPA filter, it can still be filtered by the HEPA filter because your viruses, they are trapped in your sweat or saliva which are actually bigger particles okay bigger than 0.3 micrometers that's why when they pass through the HEPA filter the virus can still be trapped okay so your HEPA and UPA capabilities are the following they can remove a broad range of airborne contaminants including fine dust smoke bacteria soot pollen and radioactive particles if you try to compare your HEPA and UPA filters, your UPA filters has more disadvantages as compared to your HEPA filters. So one is having restricted airflow and then your UPA filter is costly, much costly or more costly than your HEPA filter and it has a shorter life. In terms of the particle size comparison, so if we have this, if this is the particle which has a size of 0.3 micrometers in diameter, this can be filtered by your HEPA filter. And then if you try to compare this size to this one, this one is bigger because this one represents a 10 micrometers diameter particle. Your UPA filter can filter a particle much smaller than this because our UPA filter can filter up to the 0.12 micrometers in diameter. So our viruses, they need to be filtered inside the biosafety cabinet because they cannot be seen by the naked eye. And also, the personnel handling the specimen containing the virus must be protected from the particle and also our environment must also be protected with the use of our HEPA filters. The first type of biosafety cabinet is the Class 1 BSC. Class 1 BSC offers personal and environmental protection but not product protection which means that the product is prone to cross-contamination. The BSC has a minimum inflow velocity of 75 feet per minute and 100% of the air is exhausted into the outside environment rather than recirculated inside a room. This type of biosafety cabinet can be used for biosafety levels 1, 2, and 3. So all the organisms that are classified under BSL 1, 2, and 3 can be process using this biosafety cabinet. Class 1 BSC is used to handle toxic powder weighing and necropsy. So weighing powders can suspend them in the air which may result in inhalation. It can also contaminate equipment and work surfaces which can lead to skin contact and ingestion. Necropsy on the other hand is related to autopsy but it's more on dead animals. If you try to look at our photo here of a biosafety cabinet, we can see different colored arrows. So we have here the orange colored arrows which represent our room air. Room air is usually contaminated air. And then we have our HEPA filtered air, which is indicated by the blue colored arrow here in the photo. And then this part here is our HEPA filter and the arrows that are colored purple 
indicate your unfiltered air or the air coming from the room. Okay, so once it passes through the HEPA filter and released into the environment, the air is already filtered. So again, for glass one biosafety cabinet, there is no recirculation of air into the room. All the air that enters the biosafety cabinet will have to be exhausted 100% into the environment already HEPA filtered. For class 2 biosafety cabinets, this type of cabinet provides personal, product, and environmental protection. So the difference between class 1 and class 2 is that your class 1, again, it does not provide product protection, whereas in class 2, your product is provided protection by the cabinet. Your class 2 biosafety cabinet provides HEPA filtered or circulated airflow within the cabinet. The exhausted air is also HEPA filtered. The air entering the biosafety cabinet is circulated with the aid of a blower or fan, which then passes through a filter that removes microorganisms as small as 0.3 micrometers in diameter or 0.12 micrometers in diameter. The downflow of air is also sterile as well as the exhausted air. There are two types of class 2 biosafety cabinets. We have the class 2A which involves HEPA filtered air that is recirculated in the room and class 2B biosafety cabinet which um, involves HEPA filtered air that is discharged out of the room or out of the building. Most of the laboratories make use of the biosafety cabinet class 2. Type A1 cabinets have an inward airflow of 75 feet per minute and recirculate approximately 70% of discharged air through the supply HEPA filter back to the work zone. All discharged air is HEPA filtered before it is exhausted, either to the room or through ducting to the outside via a canopy connection that serves to minimize the effect of fluctuations in room airflow on cabinet performance. Recirculation of air within the cabinet and discharge of exhaust air directly to the room preclude the use of type A1 cabinets for volatile chemicals or volatile radionuclides. Minute quantities of volatile toxic chemicals or radionuclides can be used in the type A2 BSE if it is exhausted to the outside via a canopy or thimble thin connection. For the class 2 type A1, BSL-1, 2, and 3, or all the microorganisms that are classified under BSL-1, 2, or 3 can be processed inside a biosafety cabinet. Also, um, it today, bacterial, viral, fungal, and parasitic contaminated specimens can also be processed using the class 2 type A1. If you try to look at our illustration here of a class 2 type A1, our orange arrows, arrow is indicated as the room air. So when room air enters the biosafety cabinet, it passes through this way, going to this portion here. And this is our blower or fan. When air starts to enter this area, which is the unfiltered air under positive pressure, our HEPA filters can already filter the contaminated air for release to the environment or for recirculation inside a biosafety cabinet. So that is the function of our class 2 type A1 biosafety cabinet. For class 2 type A2 BSC, it's the same with the class 2 type A1. They only differ in the minimum inflow velocity because type A2 BSC has a minimum inflow velocity of 100 feet per minute, whereas for class 2 type A1, it has 75 feet per minute minimum inflow velocity. They have the same function, especially in exhausting 30% of the filtered air into the environment and recirculating 70% of the filtered air inside your biosafety cabinet. Okay, so if you take if you try to look at your Type A2 biosafety cabinet, we have here the orange colored arrows indicated as the room air. It gets inside your biosafety cabinet and then it passes through the grill work in this area. 
and then it enters this area here which is an area containing positive pressure the air gets blown by a fan in this area and these are your HEPA filters here so once air gets inside this area your air could either be exhausted into the environment and recirculated inside your biosafety cabinet class 2 type a cabinets are the most common biosafety cabinets which accounts for about 90 percent of all biosafety cabinets in the world class 2 type a cabinets are divided into two main variants type a1 and type a2 with the airflow pattern below so in this slide, you can see the airflow pattern of your types A1 and A2. And if you try to look closer, they actually have the same or identical airflow pattern. The important differentiating factor is that on A1 cabinet, the contaminated plenum is bordering ambient air, where on the A2 cabinet, it is surrounded by negative pressure. In this slide, the red color indicates the contaminated plenum under positive pressure. This is the most dangerous part of the cabinet. The blue color indicates the negative pressure area created by the blower. So this is the blower and the entire blue colored area here contains negative pressure. On the A1 cabinet, if there are leaks on the red plenum, if the HEPA filter gasket or front cover is compromised, then the contaminants will be pushed outside to the room by the presence of your positive pressure. So basically, the class 2 type A1 cabinet is a dangerous design. If we compare our class 2 type A1 cabinet, if you try to compare their structure, we still have the presence of our contaminated plenum under positive pressure and we also have our blue colored areas which contains the negative pressure so this one contains a negative pressure and we have a smaller portion here which contains also negative pressure so basically our positive pressure contaminated plenum is surrounded by negative pressure now in cases of leaks in this portion in the contaminated plenum um, this will be prevented because of the presence of this negative area the small portion here which has the negative pressure the contaminants will be pulled back by the negative pressure back inside the plenum so this is a safe design much safer design compared to your class 2 type a1 Type B1 cabinets maintain an average phase velocity of 100 feet per minute and are designed so that small quantities of carcinogens and volatile radionuclides required for microbiological work can be handled safely. To prevent buildup of these chemicals within the cabinet, downflow air is split with a portion directed to the front of the cabinet and a portion directed to the back of the cabinet where it is exhausted directly through a HEPA filter and to the outside via hard ducting without recirculation within the cabinet. Volatile chemicals should be handled in the direct exhaust or in the rear portion of the cabinet to prevent recirculation. Approximately 30% of outgoing air is recirculated as HEPA filtered downflow air. Type B1 cabinets are suitable for BSL-1, 2, or 3 agents treated with volatile toxic chemicals and volatile radionuclides used in microbiological studies if the work is performed in a direct exhaust or the rear portion of your biosafety cabinet. Looking at our illustration in this slide, this is our class 2 type B1. This is our class 2 type B1 biosafety cabinet. So we have here our room air as indicated by the orange arrow. It goes or gets inside our biosafety cabinet and it goes together with our unfiltered air under negative pressure. They go in this portion of our biosafety cabinet or in this portion where the fan or blower is located. When they enter in the HEPA filters, 
Okay, this is our HEPA filters. Most of the air or 30% of the air is recirculated back into the work zone or our biosafety cabinet and 70% is exhausted outside the building or into the environment. So always remember that in the presence of our HEPA filters, all the contaminated air will be free from contaminants or microorganisms before they are released or recirculated in the work zone. Class 2 type B2 cabinets maintain an average phase velocity of 100 feet per minute. These cabinets are referred to as total exhaust cabinets because all inflow and downflow air pass through the cabinet only once without any recirculation and then directly exhausted through a HEPA filter and to the outside via hard ducting. Because there is no recirculation of air within the cabinet, downflow air must be drawn in from the room, usually at the top of the cabinet, and then HEPA filtered prior to entering the cabinet. Type 2 cabinets are suitable for BSL-1, 2, or 3 agents treated with volatile toxic chemicals and volatile radionuclides used in microbiological studies. Because there is no recirculation of air within the cabinet, type B2 cabinets are expensive to operate and should be specified only when required for use of volatile toxic chemicals and volatile radionuclides. Type B2 cabinets do not provide additional biosafety protection over other class 2 biosafety cabinets. Looking at our photo here of a class 2 type B2 biosafety cabinet, again, our room air is indicated by the orange colored arrows entering our biosafety cabinet either through the sash or through the top of the cabinet and then once it enters the biosafety cabinet, it mixes with the unfiltered air under negative pressure. It goes through this portion here where our, our HEPA filters are located and then once it passes through the HEPA filters, it gets exhausted into the environment 100%. Class 3 biosafety cabinets are of a glove box design that provides the highest level of personal protection as well as product and environmental protection. Both supply and exhaust air or HEPA filter. Exhaust air is discharged to the outdoors through double HEPA filters. Passage of materials into and out of the Class 3 biosafety cabinets requires passage through a long tank or double door pass through box that can be decontaminated. Class 3 cabinets provide the highest level of containment and can be used for work involving any infectious agent. However, they are most appropriate for work involving PSL4 agents. Aside from that, all filtered air must be exhausted. So your hands enter the cabinet through the gloves attached to the sash or opening glass. So this is your gloves. It's also equipped with alarm for negative pressure and exhaust failure and volatile toxic chemicals as well as toxic powders and radionuclides can be handled inside the cabinet. So this slide contains the summary of the key characteristics of the different class 2 biological safety cabinets. We have our type A1, type A2, type B1, and type B2. So they are differentiated in terms of the minimum average info velocity through front opening or the sash, air patterns, HEPA filter downflow air, HEPA filtered exhaust air, type of exhaust, contaminated ducts and plenums, and work with volatile toxic chemicals and radionuclides. So in terms of minimum average into velocity through the front opening or sash, your type A1 is the different among the four because it has an info velocity of only 75 feet per minute, whereas the rest, they have 100 feet per minute as the info velocity. In terms of air patterns, so this is about the amount of air that is exhausted or circulated um, in the biosafety cabinet. So your types A1 and A2 
30% of the air is exhausted out of the biosafety cabinet and 70% is recirculated within the BSC. For type B1, it's the opposite of your type A1 and A2 because your type B1, greater than 70% of the air is exhausted outside of the BSC and only 30% is recirculated within the BSC. For type B2, no air is recirculated. 100% of the air is exhausted outside of your biosafety cabinet. For the HEPA filter downflow air, your types A1 and A2, they are the same. They are composed of mixed downflow and inflow from common plenum. Whereas your type B1, it's more on inflow air and your type B2, air is drawn from the containment zone or from the outside atmosphere. For the HEPA filtered exhaust air, we have here for types A1 and A2 recirculated to the containment zone or directly to the outside atmosphere. For type B1 and type B2, they also have the same HEPA filtered exhaust air exhausted through dedicated exhaust plenum to the outside atmosphere. In terms of the type of exhaust, so your type 1 and type 2, they can be thimble connected, whereas your type B1 and type B2 are hard ducted. For contaminated ducts and plenums, um, only your type A1 has negatively pressured or surrounded by negatively pressured ducts or plenums and Sometimes the plenums may be positively pressured in some models, whereas for types A2, B1, and B2, um, the plenums are surrounded by negative pressure. Okay. When working with volatile toxic chemicals and radionuclides, type 1, type A1 does not allow um, processing of volatile toxic chemicals. Whereas for type 2, minute amounts can be allowed to be processed. Type B1, low levels of volatile toxic chemicals and trace amounts of radionuclides can also be processed. And type B2, it allows processing of your volatile toxic chemicals and radionuclides. To help you choose or select the correct safety cabinet for your facility, here is a table summarizing the different um, biosafety levels and the kind of protection they offer and what type of biosafety cabinet class are you going to use. So for example, for biosafety levels 1, 2, and 3, if you only want personal and environmental protection but not product protection, then you can make use of biosafety cabinet class 1. For biosafety levels 1, 2, 3, if you want to guarantee or provide personal product and environmental protection, then you have to choose biosafety class 2 cabinet. And our class 2 cabinets are further classified into four, your types A1, A2, B1, and B2. And lastly, our biosafety level 4 which also offers personal product and environmental protection, you can make use of the biosafety class 3 and or class 2 when used in suit room with an appropriate um, suit. Germicidal UV lamps have been used in class 2 biological safety cabinets to keep the biosafety cabinets interior clean, especially when the BSC is not in use. It is a recommended accessory for BSE or laminar flow bench, especially when working with cell cultures, PCR, or other genetic materials because the UV radiation is efficient in breaking up chemical bonds and denaturing DNA and RNA. Under prolonged exposure, these chemical changes lead to dysfunctional genetic material and eventually cell death. Germicidal lamps use low-energy radiation. It's so low that the waves are incapable of penetrating barriers or of reflecting from most surfaces. This simply means that for UV lamps to be effective, the target must be in direct line of sight with the light source. However, for those people populating the laboratory or standing outside of the enclosure with nothing but a sheet of glass between them and a blue tube of light, this is a good thing. It means that the sheet of glass is more than sufficient to block you from becoming irradiated.
we have to remember two simple rules for using the UV lamp. First is, if you're using naked DNA or RNA or when you're performing PCR, UV lamps are excellent at rendering these materials harmless because the UV lamp radiation denatures the protein. And number two, if you are doing anything else with a biological material, do not rely on UV lamps alone to keep your work area clean. That's why germicidal UV lamps are not substitutes for proper cleaning of the BSC work zone. It is still important to disinfect the biosafety cabinet before and after using. For cleaning and disinfection, these are the following important things that we need to remember when we use our biosafety cabinets. First is, we always have to check the electrical requirement before use. So remember that most of the laboratory equipment require electricity. And electricity is one of the hazards that we encounter inside the laboratory. So it's important that we have to check the required voltage for the biosafety cabinet before we plug it in the outlet. Number two, turn the UV lamp at least 30 minutes before use and be sure to turn it off during the operation. So um, since in the previous slide we have mentioned the efficacy of our UV lamp in denaturing microorganisms that are present inside the biosafety cabinet, um, we have to turn on the UV lamp to somehow decontaminate or sanitize our biosafety cabinet so that when we use the cabinet, it's already clean. And when we are going to start our operations or processes inside the BSC, we need to turn the UV lamp off. Third, for work table and sides, we have to use sterile or non-use cloths which do not shed particles or fibers. And to disinfect, use cloths damp with a disinfecting solution which does not damage or affect the paintwork, stainless steel, or glass. So we also have to check the quality or the kind of disinfectant that we are going to use inside our biosafety cabinet because this is also to ensure that our biosafety cabinet will not be affected by the kind of um, disinfectant that we are going to use. And lastly, a pre-cleaner prior to a disinfectant can also be done with water and soap, especially for biosafety cabinets that are soiled. You really have to perform pre-cleaning first before using your disinfectant. For the summary of lesson three, on our discussion about biosafety levels and the different biosafety cabinets. So these are the important things. BSCs provide effective primary containment for work with infectious materials or toxins. Um, remember that our causative agents are classified based on the different biosafety levels. So our biosafety cabinets should be appropriate with the kind of causative agents that we are going to process or handle inside the laboratory. This can only be achieved when our biosafety cabinets are number one, properly installed by a professional technician. Number two, it's properly certified or validated and well-maintained. And number three, the people or the laboratory personnel that are manipulating our biosafety cabinets are properly trained and when we are going to use our biosafety cabinets, um, it should be in conjunction with good laboratory techniques. So remember all the good laboratory practices that were discussed in the different um, biosafety levels. You have to be aware of those laboratory practices so that you would be able to know what are the do's and don'ts when using the biosafety cabinet. So that's it. That's our lesson for on the different BSLs and BSEs. So thank you so much for listening to our discussion.